going to begin the second of our third part series on the indigenous Americas, and today's focus is going to be on the Aztec and Inca civilizations. So we're going to cover the Aztecs first, who called themselves the Mexica, or Mexica. Um, their capital city was in the center of Lake Texcoco, um, and they called it Tenochtitlan. It was the center of their empire. At one point in time, it probably housed around 700,000 people, which is an astounding number of people at this point in time. Um, and this is currently where Mexico City is. Most of Lake Texcoco has been filled in to accommodate for the expansion of um, current Mexico City. So one of the ways that agriculture was facilitated in Lake Texcoco was the construction of chinampas, which were these kind of floating gardens. So these gardens were used to produce food crops as well as things like flowers, which were used for altars. So this was a really ingenious farming method. It took advantage of the waterway existing here so that they didn't have to build irrigation channels. They kind of went backwards. Instead of building irrigation channels, they just built the gardens right on top of the water. So one of the ways that the Aztecs gained so much power and authority in this region at this time is that they established these relationships with the groups that they conquered where they didn't just kill everybody, but they said, we'll let you live, but we're going to make you pay us tributes. So you every year you need to give us this much stuff and we will let you exist in our empire. So you probably recall at, um, the page from the Codex Mendoza, the, the fronts piece right here that we covered a couple of units ago, which kind of showed the, the social stratification of um, Tenochtitlan, as well as the con the conquest of neighboring civilizations um, by Tenochtitlan and the Mexica. This is another page from the Codex Mendoza right here that indicates items that were exchanged for tributes. So you can see that there were several animals and some sort of like jade beads, or in this case, jedite. Um, bird feathers were another common tribute item. Uh, birds from all corners of the empire um, were coveted for their brightly colored feathers, which were oftentimes used in ritual objects or garments. And of course, we have a couple of jaguar pelts as well. Basically, they were able to, by doing this, obtain materials from a very large area. So you have some objects that contain uh, materials from as far north as the, um, as like Colorado and, and as far south as like Colombia and those regions of South America. So they were able to obtain a large number of items from around their vast empire and use them in their art. Um, the Aztecs also had a complex polytheistic religion, so a religion with many gods, and like other indigenous American cultures that we've covered thus far, had lots of connections to cosmology and calendars. So they very much observed the sky and coordinated rituals based on the basically the, the cosmic order of the universe. Um, a lot of the art and history that has come down to us currently from the Aztecs revolves around violence and sacrifice. And this is something that the Aztecs are particularly infamous for. Um, one of the misconceptions about the Aztecs is that they were violent for violence sake. Um, but in this case, violence was seen as a way to perpetuate the cycle of life. It was thought that like new life could not emerge until old life was extinguished. So that's one of the reasons that human sacrifices and the shedding of blood was so common in a lot of these cultures. It was seen as something to facilitate the emergence of new life and to appease the gods. So the Aztec Empire was toppled during the Spanish conquest in the 1520s and the Spaniards basically built Mexico City on top of the ruins of Tenochtitlan. So one of the uh, vestiges of the Aztec Empire that still exists today is the Templo Mayor, which is very close to the Zocalo, or the main kind of plaza area, area of historical Mexico City. So a couple of decades ago, there was um, the ruins of the um, Templo Mayor were rediscovered and unearthed. So you can actually go to Mexico City today and you will see like modern buildings next to the ruins of this massive temple, which in its heyday stood about 90 feet high. 
So the Templo Mayor was seen as a representation of the Coatepec, which is the snake mountain, which features pretty prominently in aspects of Aztec mythology. I want to talk a little bit about Coatepec soon. So um, this mountain right here, this kind of like uh, manifestation of this mythological mountain contained two um, kind of twin temples, and each of these temples was devoted to a different god. So the temple on the left was devoted to Tlaloc, who was the god of rain and architecture. His temple is blue, like the color of water. And then the temple on the right was devoted to, and this is a mouthful, Huitzilopochtli, the god of sun and war. So the two deities together represented this concept of burnt water. Um, and burnt water, this, this combination of op opposites, was usually used to represent this concept of of warfare and of course the Aztecs valued warfare because it was the source of a lot of their wealth and success by basically conquering other people. So, of course, as we see with lots of other monuments from the indigenous Americas, there is an alignment with cosmology in this building. So at the spring and autumn equinoxes, the sun actually rises exactly between the two temples. So over the course of its existence, around 200 years, the temples and the pyramid below were rebuilt around six times. And we can actually see the evidence of this today when we look at the ruins of the Templo Mayor. You can see that they were kind of nested on top of one another. So the original temple was probably the smallest, and then the new temple was built on top of that, and then the third temple was built on top of the second temple, and so on. So it's kind of like a, a matryoshka doll of a temple. So oftentimes they would rebuild the temple because they came into some resources and they're like, okay, we're going to make the, the mountain even taller because it's a really important building. I mean, you need to make it hierarchically larger than everything else. And then also, of course, when you build a city on top of a lake, it's prone to, it's prone to flooding. So there was also flood damage that necessitated the reconstruction of this building on several occasions. So the building was unfortunately destroyed by the Spanish um, about 500 years ago and was just recently rediscovered and is continuously excavated to this day. So we're still finding out stuff about this structure. So here is a reconstruction of the Templo Mayor as well as the kind of like central buildings within the center of Tenochtitlan. These items right here are not in the AP curriculum, but I thought I would bring them up. There's a couple of serpent motifs. Um, again, we see snakes a lot in um, indigenous American art and architecture. So we see some snakes at the foot of this so-called snake mountain. There's also this figure called a chakmul right here, which is oftentimes associated with the god Tlaloc. Um, and then there's also this altar with these adorable frogs on it. Um, so the frogs were oftentimes associated with the coming of the rainy season because the croaking of frogs was seen to like foretell the coming of rain. So here is the Templo Mayor and he, you can see kind of the temples kind of like nested on top of one another. Um, here is the Tlaloc Temple and the Hitzilopochtli Temple. We're also going to talk about the sacrificial stone on the top and the Koyoshakui monolith on the bottom here. So at the very top is the sacrificial stone, um, and this is what it looked like. You've probably seen this motif before. It's called the calendar stone or the sunstone. You can probably um, see why it's called the sunstone by its um, round motifs and these rays that are radiating, excuse me, from the center. Um, this particular item depicts sculpted motifs that represented the central components of Aztec cosmology, including aspects of their calendar. So, of course, we have this um, really important relationship between time and cosmic order that is manifesting in an object like this. Um, and, of course, this sort of object would have been used to coordinate rituals as well as to actually coordinate the rituals or to, to make the rituals happen themselves. So it's no longer present in the, um, the item itself, but there used to be a flint blade that was in the mouth of the central figure right here and the blade was sharp enough that it was actually used for human sacrifices so what would happen is that a 
um, usually a prisoner of war, would be sacrificed at the top of the temple, and then their body would be thrown down the steps to topple 90 feet below to land on the Koil Shakri stone, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. So again, the shedding of blood is to keep the gods happy. It's to perpetuate the cycle of life and death. One of the things that the Aztecs or Mexica also did was that they collected items from previous civilizations. So the Olmecs were a group of people that lived in what it what is the area that is primarily modern day Guatemala. And they created these massive stone heads. You've probably seen pictures of them. They also were particularly famous for creating these very droopy baby faced looking jade masks. So um, this piece is actually much older than other artifacts that were found at the Templo Mayor site and was included in an offering. So there were several offering bundles that were associated with the Templo Mayor and they contained everything from alligator skeletons to feathers to items like this which were given as offerings likely to appease the gods or to commemorate the establishment of the site. So this piece is about a thousand years older than mostly everything else at the site. So um, the presence of these objects indicates that the Aztecs saw them and had an appreciation for them and that they saw value in them. They saw these things and they were like, okay, this object is worthy enough to be offered to the Aztec gods, even though these people might not have believed in necessarily the same things that we did. So that appreciation for other cultures was pretty unique. All right, so here's the Koyo Shakui stone. So Koyo Shakui um, is a name that means she of the golden bells or bells her cheeks. So that refers to these earrings on that are hanging from her face. So this is actually a part of a narrative, and the narrative goes like this. So Koyal Shakwi is the daughter of Koat Lekwe, who is the serpent-skirted goddess. She actually is just like two snakes, and then she has a ser a a skirt made of snakes, because that's Aztec mythology. So Koyal Jacqui and her 400 brothers planned to murder their mother, mother Coatlicue, the serpent-skirted lady. But when Koyal Jacqui attacked, her brother, Huitzilopochtli, emerged and killed his sister, and then threw her down the step, threw her down um, Mount Co Coat. Coatepec, um, and her body basically dismembered into several pieces. So what we see here is Koyal Shakui's body that has been completely dismembered. You can see there's like areas um, where her head has been severed from her torso, and then her arms and legs have also been severed. There's several other um, deities and figures that are kind of surrounding the figures and filling in the negative spaces. Um, and these gods are oftentimes associated with chaos or or discord. So that's representing kind of like the the climax of action at this moment where this is like the, the most dramatic thing that is happening. There's also a skull attached to her belt and her belt is made of snakes because again, this is indigenous American art and there's tons of snakes. The figure is also nude, which is a form of humiliation to the Aztecs. They would have seen nudity as something that was more debasing and shameful. Um, also, there's a couple of um, features on Koyal Shakui's body that indicate her um, kind of like maternal status. She has sagging breasts and a sagging stomach, which typically are features in this particular culture that are associated with a woman who has given birth. So the mythology um, and the placement or the, the placement of this stone reflected its purpose in that it was the place where the bodies that were flung down the Templo Mayor were supposed to land. It was essentially like supposed to be something that represented what would happen at this temple, recreating that myth to uh, perpetuate the cycle of life. There have been a couple of color reconstructions made um, of the stone based off of um, microscopic evidence that was found. Um, and this is a possible reconstruction here with some ochres and yellows and perhaps some cobalts used to pigment the stone. 
Our next piece is the ruler's feather headdress. So this feathered headdress's provenance is a little bit sketchy. There's not a lot of certainty in terms of how it was um, obtained and who it belonged to before it got into the hands of the Europeans. But most theories seem to believe that this belonged to Montezuma II, who was the last kind of like really kind of like entrenched in power Aztec ruler who was killed by the Spaniards. So these long green feathers that create the headdress come from the Quetzal bird. So Quetzal birds are very rare and very coveted nowadays. They had a lot of mythological sub significance to the Aztecs. They actually had several gods and deities that were associated with the Quetzal, including Quetzalcoatl, who was like this massive serpent that was covered in green feathers. So these feathers are particularly coveted and rare because they're only produced by the male of the species and the male only produces two of these feathers during its lifetime. So this particular headdress contains 400 feathers, so that's 200 birds that had to be captured and de-feathered to create a headdress like this. So the number is significant here in that it signifies eternity. So to give you a sense of the size of this object, this is where a person's head would go. There is some documentation that indicates that there used to be a golden bird beak that was associated with this headdress as well and would have been worn as part of the ceremonial regalia of the emperor. So there's some provenance to suggest that this fe feathered headdress was given to Hernán Cortés, who represented the Spaniards, who came over um, from, the, from Europe. And it was given, and it was supposedly going to be given to Charles V as a sign of respect and goodwill. But there are some other sources that suggest that it was taken forcefully after Montezuma was dispatched. So the feathered headdress has been in Vienna, Austria for centuries, and Mexico has been fighting for years to get the artifact back, as it is the only artifact of its kind. Um, Vienna has been like, oh, it's, it's too fragile to ship overseas, and, and they've been kind of cagey about it, as many museums in the the West have been about objects that like that are from countries that are requesting them back because they are of extreme like historical and cultural importance. So an object like this would have is essentially priceless in terms of the materials that were used to create it. Um, not only the feathers, but of course the gold and the turquoise that are in the kind of like more proximal locations of the headdress. We are now going to be moving on to the Inca Empire. So Inca can be spelled with a C or a K. I've seen lots of different spellings. So the Inca occupied the west coast of South America, so from approximately Chile to Colombia, um, oftentimes in areas that were very difficult to access and survive in. So there were Inca in the desert regions along the coast, as well as in these very high altitude mountain regions that are very difficult to to survive in, essentially. So it's really remarkable that the civilization not only survived in these mountainous regions, but they figured out ways to thrive there as well. They also came up with several modifications and adaptations to their architecture to accommodate for the fact that this was a pretty this is a pretty si seismologically active area. There's lots of earthquakes. So they actually carved their stones for their masonry in such a way where there was enough give where the stones could shift around during earthquakes so that they wouldn't just completely topple down. So the Inca were masters of this architectural technique called ashlar masonry. So ashlar masonry involves carving stones um, and using masonry that doesn't involve mortar. So there's nothing that is sticking these stones together. It's not like the brick and mortar that you would see on a brick building on the East Coast of the United States, where it's like you have regularly sized bricks and you're sticking them together with a sort of glue. These stones are specifically cut and shaped in such a way where they are intended to fit together, almost like Legos. And their combined weight, as well as the fact that they are all matched together, is what is giving these structures integrity. And and why they're still standing after 500 plus years.
So the Inca were extremely organized in terms of their social and political structures. Um, they had a very well-maintained system of roads. And you can imagine, like, given the size of the empire itself, like, even despite this, they were able to maintain communication and also have lots of kind of communication between even the far furthest reaches of the empire because of this organized political structure and road system. So the Incas did not have a writing system. So most of what we know has been deduced from oral history and archaeological remains. There's lots of stuff that was written by the conquistadors as well. So we have their oral and written accounts um, that are giving us some insight into what a lot of these places might have looked like 500 plus years ago. Unfortunately, a lot of what the Spaniards did is that they would go into the temples and they would take all of the gold and they would melt it down. Um, so a lot of those objects have unfortunately been lost and a lot of that context has been lost. Another thing that has happened is that very much like Mexico City, um, they just basically decided to build the Spanish settlement literally right on top of the ruins of the Inca stuff. So there's places like the city of Cusco where you have like the main golden temple and there was just like a convent built on top. So this is one of the objects that escaped the, um, the, the crucibles of the, the Spaniards where they would just melt everything down. This is one of a couple of surviving maize cobs maize cob sculptures um, that came from the Inca culture. So maize, um, also known as corn, is a food staple for many agricultural societies in the indigenous Americas, and it was also especially important for the Incas. So maize for the um, Inca also had a specific ritual purpose. It was used to make chicha, which is corn beer, and it was eaten at political feasts and other important events. So it was oftentimes regarded as a food that was more like ritually significant. It wasn't something like as banal like as something that you would get at like a backyard barbecue it was a really coveted food item maize comes in lots of different colors you've probably seen images of so-called indian corn where there's like purple and orange and yellow and like every shade in between so there's certainly a link to the idea that there's this oxidized silver sheen on this corn. There's some kind of like black and like purplish gray corn varieties that actually look quite like this. So these particular maize cobs were life-sized. And there is some evidence provided in written histories that objects like these were once part of a garden of more maize and other food staples that were important to the Incas. Um, it was thought that these um, like little miniature gardens were seen as p potentially offerings to the gods to ask for a bountiful harvest or even a representation of the bounties um, produced by the extensive Inca empire to be like, this is my little like gold and silver universe. This is a representation of the bounty of our empire and demonstrates what we are able to do and what has made us successful. So there is some written documentation that describes a garden in Cori Concha which is the Temple of the Sun, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, that describes the, this garden in the center of this temple that contained metal llamas and vicuñas and other kind of like camelid animals, as well as human figures and maize cobs. And it kind of represented like a, almost like a dollhouse of the kind of like social and like natural order of the Inca Empire. Cusco was very much seen as like the Axis Mundi, the center of the Inca universe, just like Tenochtitlan was seen as the center of the Aztec universe. So this little garden in Corticancha might have served as a miniature representation of this universe. So the textures um, on the metal were created here using repousse which is a technique that involves taking a piece of sheet metal and then hammering it on into it on one side and then having a texture appear on the other. So um, sheet metal techniques were particularly common in Inca art. We see gold and silver, and then there's also some copper alloys that were used as well to create these kinds of objects. So objects like this represent this idea that the Incas were able to create representational art. Um, there's a, a lot of kind of like 
misconceptions that the Incas only created geometric art or they only created highly stylized art that was like only partially representational. But when I see objects like this, um, I definitely get the sense that the Incas were able to create these very true to life representations of the world that they saw around them. We are now moving on to the city of Cusco. This is the historic capital of the Inca Empire. Just as Tenochtitlan is the capital to the Aztecs, the city of Cusco is the capital for the Incas. So the city plan is shaped like a puma. Um, when you And a puma is basically like a like a jaguar. Um, there's still some speculation as to whether this was intentional or not. When I look at this city, I see a profile of a puma. I don't know about you, but um, you see prof I see a profile and then I can see like its legs and tail like in profile. Um, and there's some documentation about the social organization of the city and how it corresponded to the different body parts of the puma. So um, the head is a fortress, which is called Saxo Oman. The heart is a central square, and then the belly is a plaza. So there's, there's some evidence to this idea that the city was intended to be shaped in this way. There was also um, a lot of kind of form fix fits function evidence to suggest that the city was um, constructed in a way to represent the ideal social stratification of the Inca like ruling elite. They were actually upper class and lower class neighborhoods that were designated um, within Cusco. And there were several kind of like institutions in place that were intended for people from all around the Inca empire to come to Cusco and they could learn crafts or they could be um, become educated in the cultures and customs of the Inca empire and then carry them back to their own city. So we're seeing a similar pilgrimage program that we did in Chavín de Juantar, for example. There was also a recruitment strategy that was used to draw um, lots of very skilled women to the capital of Cusco so that they could become skilled weavers or people who would marry into the elite families or make that ritual corn beer. So much of the original city and its buildings were actually used as the foundations of the more modern structures that were built after um, the Spaniards invaded Peru. Um, so we can see an example of this here. So this is um, the Cori Concha or the Temple of the Sun right here. These are its foundations. And then the Spanish Baroque style convent was built literally right on top of it. So there's a couple of different items within the city of Cusco that I'm going to cover. So these are the walls at Saxo Roman. I've seen this spelled like 15 different ways. I have included a picture with some human figures in here to give you a sense of the scale of these walls. So these walls are surrounding this area that most archaeologists think was supposed to be a fortress. There's some evidence that it was not quite finished yet. What you'll notice when you look at these walls is that the stones are irregular shapes. And again, the the um, the Inca in particular were really skilled in this method of creating architecture where they had these stones fitting into these individual niches and the walls were very like structurally sound and able to withstand seismic activity. So some stones in this complex weighed up to 70 tons, and they were all hauled using human labor. And in this case, a lot of these stones were actually hauled from a quarry that was more than two miles away. So imagine not only carving out this massive stone from a mountain, but then having to move it two miles and then get it into place. So it's really a remarkable feat of engineering that they were able to construct these massive walls like this. So this is the Cordy Concha, um, also known as the Temple of the Sun. This was regarded as probably the most important building in the city of Cusco. Um, and it was very much built in such a way to emphasize its importance. What you'll notice when you look at the masonry of Cordy Concha is that the rocks are pr pretty regularly shaped. They are like mostly squares and rectangles. It's a lot more orderly and neat and organized than the walls that you're seeing in Saxo Oman. So this would have taken a lot more time and manpower to create than something like the walls at Saxo Oman, which is indicating the importance of this building.
There is also a lot of double jammed doors. So you would have like one entrance and then you would have like a smaller doorway within that doorway. And that was something that was usually reserved for buildings with like hierarchically higher importance. It was also recorded in written documentation that all of the walls of the courtyard which now looks like this, were once covered in gold leaf. So this, you just you can just imagine coming across this building and all the walls are covered in gold. And when the sun is hitting this building, it is just like this blinding light. So it's very easy to see why they would have used gold for a building like this, because when the light hit this building, it would have shone like the sun. One of the other hallmarks of Inca architecture are the trapezoidal shapes of the walls. So the walls don't just go straight up. They're not exactly perpendicular with the ground. They're actually going up at a slightly upward angle. So whenever you see this trapezoidal wall structure, that usually indicates that it's, that it's Inca architecture. So this particular temple was also used as an observatory for priests to chart the night sky. So observatories um, were oftentimes built in these hierarchically important locations because cosmology was a very important like part of cultural practice. Again, um, observing the cosmos and making sure that rituals are taking place to maintain cosmic order. We are now moving on to Machu Picchu. There's a lot of similarities between um, the city of Cusco and Machu Picchu in terms of the methods that are being used to construct a lot of the architecture. We are again seeing that trapezoidal shape um, for the construction of walls and buildings. Machu Picchu in particular is about a three days walk from the city of Cusco. It's as the crow flies not that far away and the location itself was not really like strategic militarily speaking but rather they really liked the view and there the view was significant in that it had a um, you could see several different mountain peaks from it. One of the kind of aspects of uh, Incan mythology was that mountain peaks were kind of like ancestral deities. So this would have been kind of like a location where you are literally in the midst of gods. So there's kind of like an element of the sublime there. So Machu Picchu was actually originally like a royal retreat or like a vacation home for the members of the ruling class. So it was kind of like a vacation home estate. It also, of course, served as a location for performing religious ceremonies, managing matters of the state, hosting feasts, and other kind of like important matters of the state that were conducted by members of the elite. So not only was it a location for these sorts of things, it also provided housing for all of the laborers that were required to maintain the site and to keep agricultural production going to supply all of these massive lavish feasts. So interestingly, when you look at the masonry that was used to construct these kind of like lower class residences, the methods that were used were a lot more shoddy and a lot that required a lot less labor than these more like official buildings or um, especially the construction that was intended to house the, um, the emperor himself. The entire complex includes about 200 buildings. Most of them were houses that originally had thatched roofs. Of course, the roofs are no longer there because they would have long ago been um, taken away by the elements. There's a couple of temples as well. There's a couple of baths. There's actually a couple of fountains that are specifically constructed to collect water and make them into pools for baths. Um, there's also an observatory like this one right here. And of course, those buildings are primarily constructed in a trapezoidal shape. So observatories come in many different forms. Oftentimes they'll have modifications to the architecture to record the movement of certain celestial bodies like stars. In some cases, they have these constructions that are intended to indicate a, a special kind of like celestial event. So this is the Intihuatana stone, uh, which translates to the hitching post of the sun. So during the summer and winter equinoxes, the sun is directly over the sun or the sun is directly over the stone, and so the stone will not cast a shadow. So it's kind of like a, a calendar in that sense. Our final work um, for today is the Alta Kapu tunic. This kind of garment was used as a status symbol by the Inca elite, and it was 
really coveted as a status symbol for several reasons. For one thing, the amount of skill and labor required to create such a garment would have been absolutely immense. And the Inca Empire was really skilled at figuring out how to allocate a certain number of laborers to learn a craft where you had enough to supply the elite, but it was still rare enough that you couldn't just go out and get your own all to Capo Tunic if you wanted one. All of these like particular luxury goods were very much controlled by the ruling elite in terms of who could make them and how many of them were made. There was also this very complex supply and demand chain for particular dyes. So um, red in particular was very coveted. It was made from the bodies of cochineal beetles, which are these um, insects that live on cacti cacti and it takes several thousand insects just to make a tiny bit of dye. So you can imagine that like just obtaining the dye and and going through the the motions of spinning the wool and just creating the raw materials to create something like this would have been immensely labor intensive and that's before you even get to the weaving. So there were actually like uh, there was a special like class of women that were oftentimes um, sent to the city of Cusco to learn how to weave textiles. They were called aquias or chosen women, and they were tasked with making textiles like this. So the ki these kinds of garments were oftentimes built on looms, and they were built as a one kind of like piece of fabric construction that had minimal cuts in it. It was seen as kind of like diminishing the power and the energy of the garment if you made lots of cuts or if you cut several pieces of fabric to make one garment. So there, these garments were usually made using one continuous piece of fabric. This particular piece of fabric was a long rectangle and then it is folded in the middle at the top. There is a slit cut right here for the head and then the sides are sewn up um, to around here so that there's some armholes. So um, the a tokapu is essentially like a small square that makes up the composition of the garment. So this is a tokapu, this is a tokapu, this is a tokapu. And these tokapus are kind of glyphic in nature. They each are meant to represent a certain individual or an event or a place. They are essentially these um, garments that are intended to tell a story about the wearer and to narrate usually his accomplishments and tell everybody like what he's done. So it's kind of like wearing a hat with lots of pins in it, and it tells you all the places that you've been, but this is a lot less tacky than that. So the owner of this particular tunic might have been an Incan ruler, as we can probably deduce by the complexity of the garment and like just how in such a, how well the condition it is. It probably belonged to somebody very wealthy. This kind of piece also represents the Inca preference for abstract designs and motifs in their art. Um, they used lots of geometric shapes to convey ideas. Again, they didn't really have a written language, but they did kind of have a pictorial language in the sense that they were able to use images to convey certain ideas and values. Also, you'll notice that this piece uses camelid fiber and cotton. So both of these materials would have been available to the Incas. Camelid fiber and other animal kind of like base tools are usually better at taking up uh, color and dye. So they were oftentimes used um, to, to like create the weaving, whereas cotton was sturdy enough to serve as kind of like the skeleton of the garment. So the they would 